nine. Ignition sequence. We choose five. to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Just one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. One, zero, and lift off. And mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history and it's come to a final stop. Seeing it down here as well. Here on the ground, the team is being led now by the uh, Orbit 2 flight director, David Korth, and he is uh, getting help from Capcom Katie Coleman, who you heard talking with Ak Aki Hoshide just a few moments ago. You can just make out in this view of the HTV-3 on the end of the Canada Arm 2 and the uh, lower left-hand portion of the screen. Again, that uh, maneuver was performed by the team here on the ground, uh, the robotics officers here in the International Space Station flight control room, and uh, started at 6.50 after flight engineer Joe Acaba had finished uh, releasing the 16 bolts that have held the HTV-3 to the Harmony node since it arrived at the International Space Station on July 27th. It actually launched into space from Tanegashima Space Center in Japan on July 28th and carried to the International Space Station 8,000 pounds of uh, supplies. Uh, that was broken down into 7,000 pounds of pressurized cargo, including uh, food and clothing. Copy, and so you are happy with cameras, Aki? You and Joe? A firm, we're happy. Okay, onward. As I was saying, the HTV-3 carried to the International Space Station 8,000 pounds of uh, cargo, including 7,000 pressurized cargo. That's food and clothing, as well as an aquatic habitat experiment, a remote-controlled Earth observation camera for environmental studies, a catalytic reactor for the station's water regeneration system, and a Japanese cooling water recirculation pump. And then it also had another uh, 1,000 pounds of uh, unpressurized cargo, it is one of the, or is the only vehicle that can carry unpressurized cargo to the International Space Station at this time. And uh, that cargo is then transferred to the Kibo Laboratory's porch or external facility. View here of uh, the flight controllers in Japan at the Scuba Space Center. They're, of course, also following along very closely with the activities today as HTV is their vehicle. And uh, also happened today uh, to get a chance to hear uh, Japanese astronaut Aki Hoshide talk with their prime minister in a 20 minute call uh, in honor of Day of Space in Japan. And that commemorates the 20th anniversary of uh, the launch of the first astro Japanese astronaut into space on uh, the first Space Lab mission, which was a cooperative venture between U.S. and Japan. Flight Director David Korth just uh, finished up a poll of the uh, flight controllers here in the International Space Station flight control room, checking to be sure that everything was ready for 
the release of the HTV3 vehicle and uh, just got a unanimous go from all the members of the room. That again is scheduled to take place at 10.50 a.m. Central Time. After that, uh, a series of maneuvers and burns are going to move the space, uh, the HTV-3 away from the International Space Station. The first is going to take place at 10.55 and um, we'll move uh, the, the vehicle away from the space station at a rate of about one, uh, 0.13 feet per second. And the second one will follow that at 11.05 Central Time. That one will go a little faster, 0.65 feet per second. And then at 11.17, a third one uh, will move uh, the begin moving the orbit of the uh, vehicle down towards the Earth atmosphere at 3.9 feet per second. The last one for the day will come in just after noon, 12.01 p.m. Central Time. And uh, that will take place after the um, HTV-3 has made it to a point six kilometers away from the station and uh, continue moving it at a rate of 4.3 feet per second. That all is going to get uh, the HTV well away from the International Space Station in time for the actual deorbit maneuvers, which are going to start occurring at 5.48 p.m. Central Time on Thursday, tomorrow. There will be three of those. Uh, after that, uh, one at 7.20 p.m. and uh, last one at uh, six, uh, excuse me, 11.50 p.m. again on Thursday. And then that should, the final one should bring the HTV-3 into contact with the Earth's atmosphere at 12.24 a.m. Central Time, which time it will begin burning up and uh, provide a good way to get rid of a good deal of trash and used supplies that the space station crew has been filling it with since they finished unpacking it after its July 27th arrival. Station Houston, uh, I have the abort time tag and windows when you're ready to copy. Ready. The abort time tag is 16-16-00. That's 1-6-1-6-0-0. One, six, one, six, zero, zero. The abort time tag, 1-6-1-6-0-0. One, six, one, six, zero, zero. That's correct, and the window, which is recorded then on uh, step four of your 1.420, is as we expected, 
15500 to 1554. And so let me make that more clear. It's 15500 to 15540. Copy 15550100 for the open and 15540100 for the window close. That's correct. And we show ourselves about 8 minutes 30 seconds from release. Capcom Katie Coleman there going over the uh, upcoming release plan with flight engineer Aki Hoshide who will be backing up Joe Akaba as the actual one to release the vehicle. View of it here through one of the windows on board the International Space Station. The view that the astronauts have of the uh, HDV-3 as they prepare to release it. They've been going over the various camera views and uh, making sure everything is ready. Vehicle is in place thanks to some work done over the past couple hours by the robotics team here on the ground to move it from its um, docked position on the Harmony node to uh, a point about 40 feet away from the International Space Station on the end of the Canada Arm 2 as you can see here. At the moment, the uh, space station and the HTV-3 are about 253 miles above the North Pacific, Coast, North Pacific Ocean and uh, heading northeast towards the coast of Washington State, which they'll cross in the next few minutes. Then they'll head uh, across the border of Washington into Canada. Station on two for SSRMS. Go ahead, Aki, and then we've got a call for you. Hey, Katie, uh, can we put step four in work at this time, which is removing safing and put the brakes off? Aki, yes, you can. We were uh, just talking about that. We have a shorthand over here, and then we'll be back to you with a, uh, a status, which is a good status. Copy. Less than five minutes away now from uh, the release of the HTV-3. It's coming up at 10.50 a.m. Central Time. The crew has a window of about four minutes uh, to, to get the release done if it doesn't happen right at 10.50, but uh, they expect to be on time at this point, and everything is, is going well in their preparations for that release. Station, you are go to release HTV on time, and that's a go to perform steps five through seven in 1.420. We go to release HTV on time, step five through seven in one decimal four two zero. In work.
momentarily uh, out of range of video downlink from the International Space Station. Um, that's expected and we should be regaining video in just a second. Less than a minute now until uh, Flight Engineer Joe Acaba will be uh, giving the command to release the HT, H2 transfer vehicle number three, or the Conatory 3, as it's called. Conatory being a word for white stork that will send it on its journey uh, back to uh, the Earth's atmosphere where it will be allowed to burn up and um, wrap up its... Uh, stay in space. It launched on July 20th from Tanegashima Space Center in Japan. Team here on the ground confirming that the uh, snares on the Canada Arm 2 are open, which uh, marks the HTV release. It took place as planned at 10.50 a.m. Central Time as uh, the space station was 253 miles above Canada. You can see here the arm backing away now.
Houston Station on two, HDV retreat is commanded and the PT timer has been started. Right now we have a PT of 53, 54, 55, 56. Houston copies, nice job. Flagineer Akihoshi Day there confirming what we could see here on the ground that uh, HTV-3 has officially been released from the Canada Arm-2, the Safe Station's robotic arm. Again, that took place on time at 10.50 a.m. Central Time, while the uh, space station was 253 miles above Canada. Now begins the task of uh, having the vehicle move away from the International Space Station, slowly at first, and then uh, gaining speed. The first uh, maneuver which is called an ISS uh, departure maneuver, will be taking place at 10.55, about three minutes from now. And that will be a thruster firing that will uh, begin moving HTV away from the space station at a rate of just under eight feet per minute. That'll be followed at 11.05, 10 minutes later, uh, by another ISS departure maneuver. And then at 11.17, the first of the descending maneuvers that will begin dropping uh, the altitude of the HTV-3's orbit will take place. And a second one of those scheduled for just after noon central time, 12.01 p.m. Station Houston for a status. We see an opening rate of 0 0.5 down here. We'd like to know what you see up there and also distance from the arm. Yeah, And Katie, uh, the range rate on the nav is about 0 0.011. And the distance from the arm is like maybe two meters. Copy. As you can see, the first of those uh, thruster firings to begin moving the HTV-3 away from the International Space Station has taken place. That again will begin moving it away at a rate of uh, just under 8 feet per minute. And then a second one will take place in another 10 minutes at 11.05 p.m. Central Time. That uh, Concur, we will see move it a bit faster at about uh, 39 feet per minute. Aki, any camera tracking you can do for us would be great. And Houston, HCV is inside on camera three. We copy, Aki. View here provided by the uh, International Space Station crew members. As uh, you heard Aki Hoshide mention, this is a view of the HTV-3 as it moves away from the International Space Station.
station Houston for HTV, we see a safe trajectory for the abort, and we'll let you know when it's outside the keep-out sphere. Copy that. Space Station is currently 256 miles above uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, uh, above um, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, just about to head out over Prince Edward Island and across the Atlantic Ocean. The, uh, the HDV-3, newly released from the Space Station's Canada Arm-2, is moving steadily away. It's performed its first uh, for firing to uh, begin moving it away from the space station and a second one is about uh, seven minutes away now. That'll take place at 11.05, be followed by another at 11.17 and one final for the day at 11.47 a.m., or excuse me, 12.01 p.m. Central Time. By that time it'll be about four miles away from the International Space Station and that will uh, move it not only away from the space station, but also begin lowering its orbit and getting it in, into place for its deorbit burns. There are three of those, and they're all scheduled to take place uh, Thursday, tomorrow evening, starting at 5.48 p.m. Central Time. They'll wrap up at 11.50 p.m., which uh, a good should have the HTV-3 experiencing the Earth's atmosphere by 12.24 a.m. Central Time on Friday. The room has recovered IOC-1, and we now have good attitude control uh, using the VDE-1 Alpha as, uh, as we planned pre-flight. Copy that. The Japanese flight control team in uh, Scuba, Japan, confirming that uh, the HDV-3 is continuing to move safely away from the International Space Station, now about uh, 360 meters in front of the station. That's more than 1,000 feet away and uh, has now, in less than five minutes, its second um, space station uh, Space Station Departure Maneuver coming up. That'll be at 11.05 a.m. Central Time and uh, increase its uh, speed uh, to a, a, an additional 39.3 um, feet per minute.
station, Houston status. Good. So an ACU abort gives us a 1.2 um, meters per second pause grade abort, and we presently see a good trajectory. It's about uh, 360 feet or more out in front of ISS, uh, more than 100 uh, feet below ISS. Uh, excuse me, I'm using feet, but it's meters. And uh, as soon as we are 200 meters below ISS, which is probably any minute, you will be officially out of the keep out sphere. The trajectory will be then up and over uh, the ISS and then trailing behind. That won't happen until we're outside the approach ellipsoid, which is a distance of two kilometers. Okay, copy. Thank you very much for that information. And I guess uh, we're out of the departure monitoring cue card. Yeah, we concur. Thank you, Aki. Katie, any action on the arm? Right now we're in standby. Standby, Aki, and we'll collect ourselves and get back to you. No problem. We'll be standing by. Capcom Katie Coleman there summarizing for the uh, crew the operations with the HTV-3 all going well at this point. The vehicle continuing to move away from the International Space Station and in less than 10 seconds it will be performing its uh, second of four maneuvers, maneuvers that are planned for the day. That will take place at 11.05 a.m. Central Time, uh, which uh, should be beginning now. And uh, that will put it uh, opening at a rate of 39.3 as it moves away from the space station. Two more will be planned for the day. One at 11.17 a.m. and then uh, the final one for the day at 12.01 p.m. Central Time, all of which get it in position for its actual deorbit burns, which are scheduled for Thursday evening. The first is going to be taking place at 5.48 p.m. Central Time, a second at 7.20 p.m. Central Time, again on Thursday evening. And uh, the last of the deorbit burns for the HTV-3, or Kunatori-3, will take place at 11.50 p.m. Central Time. That will drop it back into the Earth's atmosphere where it will burn up and uh, provide a good uh, way for the International Space Station to get rid of uh, some trash and use supplies, in addition, of course, to the service that it provided, bringing a 8,000-pound load of cargo to the International Space Station on July 27th. With that, we'll be wrapping up our HTV-3 release coverage. Again, the release took place on time at 10.50 a.m. Central Time, and it's now moving safely away from the International Space Station. You can stay tuned, however, and at 11.30 a.m. Central Time, we'll be replaying the uh, Jack's uh, uh, VIP call that took place earlier this morning. We're in the flight engineer, Agi Hoshide, talked with the Japan Prime Minister, Yoshihiko Noda uh, for about 20 minutes in honor of the uh, Day of Space in Japan, which marked the 20th anniversary of the launch of STS-47 on the first Space Lab mission. That mission was a cooperative venture between the U.S. and Japan and also took uh, into space the uh, first Japanese astronaut. They'll be discussing all of that in the uh, replay of this phone call or uh, event from earlier today, and again, that will be taking place at 11.30 a.m. Central Time, coming up next on NASA TV. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Ready for the event. Tokyo, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Tokyo, station for a voice check. Station, Japanese... Min Prime Minister's office, how do you read Miyaki? Satoshi, loud and clear. Good evening. Good evening. Good, good to talk to you. Joko Chikoyamas, Hoshide san. So we hear you very well, Mr. Hoshide. Hi, Kotiba Muyoko Chikoyamas. 
We hear you well, too. So, Prime Minister, please give message to Mr. Hoshide, who is on OISS. So, this is Yoshihiko Noda, and I haven't seen for a while. Thank you so much for all your efforts aboard ISS. So, you've been on space for more than two months. How are you feeling? Hi, sorry. Prime Minister, nice to see you. Yes, since the launch, for several days, my body took some time to get used to the non-gravity, so I wasn't 100 percent okay, but since then, my body has fitted well to the environment, and I'm quite busy with my tasks. But um, I'm having really a useful day, and the six of us on ISS, we are having a good time on ISS. So the six people aboard are having good time. So Americans and Russians are also abroad. So this is a long stay on space, and you are in a real small spaceship. And is there any um, knack to getting well together amongst yourself? Well, we've been trained to get along. But I think the important thing is to respect each other. Uh, we are all different people, but um, to respect each other is important. And also to help each other is very important. If somebody is having trouble with his task, and if you're free, we also help each other. So we have to be good as a team. And more than anything, we need to enjoy our task, and we need to enjoy our time on ISS. Well, you had the extra vehicular activities over eight hours, and I'm sure that it was a very tense moment. Just having this conversation, I feel quite tense, and all your junior members here, the young people, are also tense. And how, what were your feelings when you were having these spacewalks? Yes, we had uh, spacewalks twice this time, but for me, this was the first time for me to engage in EVA. This is my second time up in space, but last time I was here, I was in uh, the spaceship, in the, the, the station, so this was the first time for me to go outside of the space station. I was quite tense when I opened the hatch and put my head and look at Earth, I was expecting myself to be extremely tense and nervous. But I found myself really quite cool-headed, and I realized this later, afterwards. And this, I think, was because we had such thorough training. We had the training at Houston. We also had training for EVA using a swimming pool. And so we had repeated training. And so I was able to conduct the EVA activities in the same dispassionate, cool-headed manner. But one thing that impressed me greatly was I was on the tip of the robot arm. I was manipulating it, and I moved. And at that time, I I was really at the far uh, ahead of the space uh, station, and in my view, there wasn't even uh, the space station in front of me. All I could see was the Earth and the pitch darkness of the universe. It was a few seconds, a few moments, but that picture was so impressive for me. Thank you. Can we ask Minister Hirano to give a question? Hello, Mr. Hoshide. Good evening. So thank you for your mission representing Japan. I have two questions. One is, so this is your second flight. Last time you stayed for two weeks, and this time you are there for two months. So this is your second mission, and probably you have different impression from your first flight. So what is your impression this time? My second question is, 
you built the Kibo, and probably Kibo is developing. How is Kibo progressing? And lastly, are you drinking alcohol in space? Hi. Yes, last time my mission was two-week shuttle mission, and that was my first time in space. And I was wondering how my body would be affected in space, how my body would adjust to space. I wasn't sure. And in the space shuttle, um, I didn't really understand how it would be. I knew only from the training, so it was an unknown environment. This time, the space station, I know how it is, especially in the Kibo, the pressurized section, I knew already what it was like. I've seen it already, so it was like almost coming home. That was how I felt at launch. And actually, when I was on the sta space station, I felt like I'd returned home. And inside the space station, especially in the pressurized section, the last time when I was here four years ago, the pressurized Kibo section was really new. And just um, when the, we put the equipment on, we returned Earth. And Mr. Ogata and Mr. Um, Furukawa, and they stayed for a long time, and they conducted various experiments. And so in a good sense, the pressurized section has become a bit old, or it's be, it's, it was utilized. And as to your third question about the alcohol, unfortunately, it is non-drinking. Um, the alcohol is not prohibited. Sometimes I long for beer, but I guess I'll just keep that for some enjoyment when I return to Earth. In the future, we would like many people to come to space, and I hope that drinking will be allowed. So, uh, Minister Furukawa, please. Hello, Mr. Hoshide. Nice to see you again. I'm the Minister of State for Space Policy. Now, after you arrived at the space station, uh, the Japanese Konotori, the HTV-3, the, the transfer vehicle was docked with the space station, and all the supplies were safely and effectively unloaded to in the space uh, station. I'd like you to tell us how you felt when it arrived. I also understand that the Konotori is now trying to separate from the space station, and how is the work going on along that line? Yes, uh, two weeks after we arrived at the space station, the Konotori arrived at the space station, bringing the various supplies, the, uh, our, everything that we need for our everyday life, uh, various agents and uh, materials that we need to conduct the experiments and others. And uh, together with other astronauts, we brought these things to the space station. We were able to do it in a smooth manner. And after that, you know, the unnecessary debris that we had accumulated, they had to be transferred to Konotori. And today, precisely, we are going to be separating Konotori from the space station. Immediately before we started this event, it was safely separated, and now Konotori is being moved for the separation uh, spot by using the robot arm. And uh, Joe Akaba and myself we will be using the robot arm to finally separate the Konotori from the space station. For about a month, the Konotori was attached to uh, the uh, space station, and I was able to see it very well from a window called Cupola. Now, I feel a bit lonely not being able to see Konotori from that window anymore. Today we have um, school children from where Mr. Hoshide attended schools. So, my name is Iroha Honda. 
There are so many things, like, such as air and gravity on Earth, which do not exist in space. Could you tell us some other things in space that do not exist on Earth? I would be glad if you would give some impressive items. That's a difficult question. Well, something that exists in space but doesn't exist on Earth, well, maybe my answer would be similar to what you just mentioned. Would, would be, well, in space, we have non-gravity, which you don't have on Earth. And another thing is, we have a viewpoint to look at the Earth from outside. Earth is round, and we can see that roundness from space, which you can't see from Earth. It's very important to see things from the outside. Like we, if you're living in Japan for a lot, many years, and if you don't understand something, you might become aware of some of those things if you are abroad. I myself experienced that. So similarly, if you go outside of Earth, you could get to know Earth even better. Osawa-san, please. Hina Osawa is my name. How is your physical condition in space as compared to your condition on Earth? Does the non-gravity disrupt your physical condition somehow? Yes, non-gravity, the first few days, Yes, I felt my head very heavy, or stuffed nose, and I felt quite tired. I wasn't 100% fit, but now I've come accustomed to this, and I feel as if I've been living in this non-gravity condition all through my life. I feel extremely well. It's Hikari Iso. Have you thought of anything that you think would improve life aboard ISS? That's a good question. As the minister asked, um, well, I, I wish there was alcohol abroad, but if we had bath or shower, it would be it would make our life more comfortable. We're using shampoo that doesn't need rinsing, and also we put um, soap on towel and we wipe our bodies, but we can't immerse ourselves in bath or we can't have shower. So if we had bath or shower, it would make our life even more comfortable. As for diet, we lack fresh vegetables or fruits. We hardly ever do. When we have the HDVs, um, for a few days after the arrival, we can have fresh vegetables or fruits, but otherwise we eat space food. So if we can cultivate those vegetables in space, it would make our lives more comfortable. Sakaguchi-kun. Tomoki Sakaguchi is my name. Uh, Mr. Hoshide, uh, you've been aboard a space shuttle, and I saw you as well. What are their respective good points? Yes, I've been on uh, the American space shuttle and on um, board a Russian Soyuz, both of them. But uh, both of them carry people on board. They have the similar system in that sense. In the case of space shuttle, seven people, astronauts, can go in it, and you can do so many things. The space shuttle itself can become an experimental laboratory and release the satellite by using the robotic arms and so forth. And uh, the Russian Soyuz, when compared to that, it's a three-man vehicle. It's a smaller one, but uh, it uh, transfers human beings to the space uh, station and bring them back to Earth in a safe manner. It has a lot of good track records. Both of them, it's pleasant to ride in it, but one thing I have not experienced yet is uh, that uh, 
思いますけれども。はい、あの骨とか、えー、筋肉、まあ、特に骨はですね、well, the bones and muscles are affected. It's difficult to notice how it's affected. As for muscle, I do exercise every day. But if I just take rest for one day, I can feel that my muscles are a bit different. And what I notice most, most is the stimulus on my feet. Um, if I run on the running machine, um, it's the sensation on the bare foot, and I feel like if it's a bit numb on the machine. So I feel that the body is becoming um, used to the non gravity and is not affected so much. My name is Natsumi Sakuma. Now, CO2 accumulated within ISS. What do you do with it? Do you throw it out of ISS? Yes, uh, ISS, Space Shuttle, and, and the uh, extra vehicular mobility unit, all of them, of course, the human beings breathe in oxygen and breathe out CO2. When the CO2 got accumulated, it's not good for human beings, so you have to get rid of that CO2. It's not as if you will throw it outside immediately, directly. You will be using various equipment, and uh, scientifically, you uh, will uh, eliminate it. You do not throw out CO2 directly outside. Prime Minister Noda, could you please give a word of encouragement? Well, so you are at the forefront of the International Space Development Corporation on board ISS, so I hope you carry out your responsibilities aboard, and I hope you will come back to Earth safely. Mr. Hirano, please, words of encouragement to Mr. Hida Hoshide. Yes, you are representing our country in your mission, so please come back with a great deal of achievement and see you in Japan. And Minister Furukawa, well, your activities um, representing the whole Japan is really a great hope for the Japanese people, especially for the children. We really hope that you will carry out your mission safely. So, the young people, please. Mr. Hoshide, see you back on Earth. Good morning from Mission Control Houston, and welcome to this Friday edition of International Space Station Update. The crew of Expedition 32 uh, in their final week as uh, a six-person crew on board the uh, orbiting laboratory. Three of the astronauts uh, there on the right uh, will be departing the International Space Station this upcoming Sunday. Uh, we'll start all the way over on the right there with uh, Russian cosmonaut Sergei Revin on his first space flight. Uh, and then uh, to the left is Expedition 32 commander and another Russian cosmonaut, Gennady Padalka, and then NASA astronaut Joe Acaba. And uh, moving across the back row, we have uh, NASA astronaut Sonny Williams, who will be taking over command of the International Space Station on Saturday. 
And then Russian cosmonaut Yuri Malenchenko and Japanese astronaut Aki Hoshide will remain on board with her as they transition from Expedition 32 over to Expedition 33. So it's been a very busy week for these astronauts on board the International Space Station with a, a slew of vehicle activity with the departure of an unmanned cargo craft and the uh, imminent departure of that Soyuz craft carrying three of our astronauts back down to the ground. In addition to all that, the regular maintenance and experiment work that consumes much of these astronauts' time. So we'll start off on Monday where NASA astronaut Joe Acaba was doing a fit check on the entry suit that he'll be wearing when he departs the International Space Station in his Soyuz TMA-04M vehicle. You can actually see that entry suit in this photo. It's, the, uh, it's a Russian so uh, Sokol suit that protects the astronauts during uh, all of their dynamic vehicle activities. So he was doing some... Uh, fit checks and uh, leak checks on that suit and also packing a few items inside of the Soyuz craft for return. In, in addition to that, he was reviewing all of the robotic procedures for the uh, upcoming release of the Japanese HTV-3 vehicle, which took place on Wednesday. Moving on, Sonny Williams uh, woke up in the morning and immediately went into some biological uh, research activities. She was working with the human research facility, taking some blood and urine samples and then storing them inside of the MELFI, which is the minus 80 degree laboratory freezer for ISS. It's one of the cryogenic freezers on board the station that is used to store uh, and keep uh, the integrity of biological samples intact before they can be transferred down to researchers on the ground. In addition to that, she was working on the VO2 max experiment, uh, which looks to document any changes in the maximum oxygen uptake for these crew members. Uh, during their long duration missions. Meanwhile, Aki Hoshide was reviewing all of the robotics operations alongside Joe Akaba on Monday, uh, as the two of them would be at the robotic controls inside of the station's cupola for all of those activities. Uh, he was also packing and stowing some final items on board of HTV, as it was uh, filled with trash and other disposable items before uh, the release from the station. He was also helping Joe get a few items over to that Soyuz craft as well. And the commander of that Soyuz craft and commander of the space station, Gennady Padalka, on Monday was uh, running through a descent simulation and consulting with teams on the ground over the uh, entire equipment list and all the stowage and the items that will be going into the spacecraft when it comes back. Also taking some time out to do some work on a Russian experiment known as the Kolonovsky Crystal, which looks to uh, determine methods to control the dynamics of specialized crystal structures using uh, magnetic fields under microgravity conditions. So uh, utilizing that unique environment of the International Space Station to do some pretty groundbreaking physics work. Uh, meanwhile, Sergei Revin, uh, one of our other Russian cosmonauts who will be returning with Gennady Padalka, was taking some photographs for a microorganism experiment on board the International Space Station. Uh, a lot of the work going on this week has been uh, wrapping up uh, some of these microorganism and biological experiment studies, as though as many of those samples as can be fit into the Soyuz as possible will be returned home. Our third Russian cosmonaut, Yuri Malenchenko, was doing some television checkouts with Russian ground sites and also installing some video gear before moving on to do some re routine replacements inside of the Russian toilet system. Moving on to Tuesday, uh, Joe Acaba removing some of the lighting assemblies from inside of the uh, Japanese HTV craft and also closing the hatch. And aside from that, he was installing the controller panel assembly on the Node 2 or the Harmony Node's uh, common berthing mechanism. Uh, as they were preparing for the final unberthing of HTV the following day on Wednesday. Meanwhile, Sonny Williams again working with that VO2 max uh, experiment on Tuesday, looking to uh, still track uh, any changes in her maximum oxygen uptake during the long duration mission. Uh, she was also working on the, uh, the vestibule between uh, Harmony and HTV disconnecting uh, some of the power jumpers that have been supplying power from the station to the vehicle while it was docked, and also installing uh, some of the thermal blankets uh, on the hatch that will protect the uh, station's hatch from any uh, thermal loads during the undocking activity. And then meanwhile, she was assisted in that uh, by Aki Hoshide on Tuesday, who was also closing out uh, all of the interior prep work for the HTV by taking some video of the entire interior setup, 
and also activating the re-entry breakup recorder, which records uh, different data points, uh, as well as taking video throughout the HTV's descent through the atmosphere as it breaks up and eventually uh, disintegrates harmlessly over the uh, Pacific Ocean. Meanwhile, on Tuesday, Gennady Padalka was continuing his crew departure prep uh, for that Soyuz landing and moving a few uh, items into the craft, and also setting up some equipment for uh, a Russian immuno experiment that he would be participating in the following day, which looks to track any uh, changes in the immune system response, uh, which past studies have shown can actually uh, decrease or weaken during uh, long duration space flights. So he was uh, setting up some equipment for that and uh, also on Tuesday Sergei Revin was actually doing his own blood draws uh, for that immuno experiment and then stowing them uh, inside of some of the cryogenic freezers on board as well as gathering some more equipment for storage in that Soyuz vehicle and the third Russian cosmonaut Yuri Malenchenko on Tuesday was setting up uh, and testing some proximity communications equipment gear uh, which consisted of an antenna switch box and a control panel for the European ATV vehicle, which remains docked to the uh, aft portion of the Zvezda service module, uh, one of three unmanned cargo craft currently docked to the International Space Station. You can see the full uh, station makeup here. Uh, only two unmanned cargo crafts currently docked as the Japanese HTV was all the way on the left there, uh, previously docked to Harmony. But ATV-3, you can see uh, all the way in the back there. So uh, Malenchenko setting up some communications and uh, control panel gear for that vehicle on Tuesday. Moving on to Wednesday, uh, which was HTV release day. Joe Acaba was setting up the robotic workstation inside of the cupola and performing the, uh, the actual demate, which occurred uh, with the commands being given at about 6.50 a.m. Central Time on Wednesday and then eventually performing that HTV release as it uh, prepared to depart the International Space Station. Uh, while all this was going on, Sonny Williams was closing out the vestibule for HTV and installing the final thermal covers, also taking over the, uh, the final depress of the vehicle. This is what HTV looked like after it was demated from the Harmony module and was being released by the space station's robotic arm. Uh, the HTV vehicle uh, which carried 4.6 tons of cargo to the International Space Station, uh, was released uh, by this robotic arm, but uh, then after uh, within a few minutes of this release, uh, an internal abort was triggered on board the HTV uh, after it had slowly started to drift back towards the arm. Uh, Japanese flight controllers later uh, acknowledged the most probable cause was what's known as a safety net software violation. So uh, one of the limits on the cargo ship's uh, thrusters was reached, uh, possibly uh, being induced by a push-off rate from that uh, robotic arm's end. Um, but uh, the uh, vehicle did exactly what it was supposed to do, and you can see it departing the International Space Station right here, moving a little bit faster than the traditional uh, one-tenth of a meter per second, so uh, sending it into a passive abort. But Again, doing exactly as it was uh, supposed to do uh, as it was departing the International Space Station uh, for the final time. So that uh, robotics and uh, HTV activity taking up much of the day on Wednesday as uh, Joe Acaba and Aki Hoshide were standing by inside of the cupola. Uh, that uh, HTV craft uh, which again carried up about 4.6 tons of cargo to the International Space Station, uh, released and demated on Wednesday. So in addition to standing by the robotics controls on Wednesday, Aki Hoshide uh, was responsible for, for closing out the vestibule alongside of Williams and installing the thermal cover and also the uh, command panel that they used for uh, any uh, command necessities also taking some time out of his day on Wednesday to speak with the office of the Prime Minister of Japan. And then meanwhile, Gennady Padalka continuing work with that immuno experiment and also doing some uh, final data takes for the uh, Russian pneumo card, which looks to study the adaptation of the cardiovascular system of these astronauts during long durations of uh, space flight. He was also working with the Russian Matryoshka experiment, which uh, uses a number of dosimeters arrayed throughout a mannequin-sized object uh, to study the radiation 
uh, levels that these astronauts are subjected to throughout different points inside of the International Space Station. While that was going on, Sergei Revin was removing a few lights uh, from inside of the Mini Research Module 2, also known as Poisk, where their Soyuz craft is currently docked to. He was also doing some of that work inside of the Zvezda Service Module, and Yuri Malenchenko was assisting uh, Gennady Padalka in deploying some of those dosimeters inside of Matryoshka, and also doing some routine maintenance on the Russian Electron system which looks to generate uh, oxygen for the astronauts breathing atmosphere on board the station. Moving on to Thursday, Joe Acaba getting in some descent training alongside of Padalka and Revan inside of their Soyuz craft and also gathering up some hardware for an activity he'll be doing today to remove and replace a fluid control pump assembly. Uh, Sonny Williams was uh, working to do a removal and replacement of the oxygen generation system, uh, similar to Electron, but over on the uh, U.S. segment. And she was uh, replacing its hydrogen sensor, and uh, she also participated in a YouTube Space Lab event, which we'll bring you a little bit later in today's show, uh, answering questions from you know, Bill Nye, the science guy, and giving a, a pretty cool inside look and doing a few experiments that were selected for on board the International Space Station. Meanwhile, Aki Hoshide taking some sound measurements uh, on board the station using acoustic dosimeters, uh, which were placed throughout the uh, station structure and are used to track uh, sound loads uh, throughout different uh, portions. He's also performing some medical scans for the SPRINT experiment, which looks to study if uh, high-intensity, uh, low-duration workouts uh, have any um, improved effect on combating uh, a loss of uh, pulmonary function and also um, muscle atrophy and bone density loss uh, inside of these astronauts. Uh, yesterday, Padalka was involved in descent drills and crew departure preps for uh, most of his day. Sergei Revin uh, servicing the Cascade experiment. He was removing uh, the bioreactor from the incubator and loading it on board of his Soyuz craft, uh, that Soyuz TMA-04M uh, spacecraft for eventual return. Also, Yuri Malenchenko was conducting uh, the periodic maintenance of the Russian Harmful Impurities Removal System, one of the uh, many um, hardware systems on board the International Space Station responsible for removing uh, any impurities or potentially uh, hazardous uh, items from the astronauts' breathing air. All of that brings us to today's activities, Friday, where Joe Acaba is uh, performing that fluid control and pump assembly uh, removal and replacement work uh, that inside of the water recovery system. He'll also be uh, reviewing the status of the contingency water containers used uh, for any um, uh, emergency or uh, any unplanned refills of the um, water recovery system's uh, supplies. Meanwhile, Sonny Williams is uh, also working on some of the uh, the water systems on board the station, doing some maintenance on the potable water dispenser's beverage adapter, and then she'll be doing some sprint ultrasound scans of her own, uh, which Hoshide was doing yesterday, again, uh, doing some scans of her legs as they continue to track uh, if this high-intensity, low-duration workout regimen has um, any different effects from the normally scheduled uh, two hours a day of exercise that these astronauts generally take. Meanwhile, Aki Hoshide is working inside of the small payload rack and focusing on the aquatic habitat, which was brought up to the International Space Station on board that HTV-3 vehicle, which departed back on Wednesday. You can see the aquatic habitat here giving a, a, a very unique uh, test bed for um, tracking any uh, biological experiments on different aquatic uh, life in microgravity environments, which can have some uh, very insightful uh, results for life down here on Earth. Uh, aside from that, he'll be removing and transferring uh, some of those acoustic dosimeters over to the uh, Soyuz 30S craft uh, for return down to Earth. <clears> then <throat> Commander Padalka will be packing up some gear inside of Soyuz and transferring some uh, sensors from that Russian Matryoshka uh, radiation experiment over to the Soyuz for return while his uh, Soyuz crewmate, uh, Sergei Revin, will be doing some uh, house cleaning work, cleaning up some of the dust collectors and fan screens, uh, which help to 
uh, constantly revitalize the astronaut's breathing atmosphere. And he'll also be gathering up some micro microbial samples uh, from a few of the Russian experiments for return down to Earth. And our final Expedition 32 crew member, Yuri Malenchenko, today, uh, immediately upon waking up, participated in the Sprut experiment, which looks to uh, track something known as orthostatic tolerance, or uh, in much simpler terms, these astronauts' ability to um, stand upright and uh, maintain proper balance upon their return to Earth. And aside from that, he was working on the biodegradation uh, experiment on board the Russian segment, which uh, is a pretty fascinating experiment that looks to investigate uh, the initial stages, stages of any uh, bio deterioration of different surfaces and structural materials inside the station. Uh, and that'll help uh, scientists and engineers understand what microorganisms are present on board the station and help develop effective methods of protecting future spacecraft surfaces, uh, inventing new uh, coatings and different uh, antimicrobials. And with all these activities going on, as mentioned, uh, three of our astronauts, uh, Padalka, Revan, and Akaba, scheduled to depart from the International Space Station and land, uh, bringing an end to Expedition 32 a little bit later this weekend on Sunday. Station, this is Houston on Space to Ground 2. Are you ready for the event? Houston, Station on 2, we're ready for the event. YouTube Space Lab, this is Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. So, Station, can you read us? This is Bill Nye at uh, YouTube headquarters in London. Do you hear us? We got you loud in here on the International Space Station. How you doing, Bill Nye, the science guy? Uh, we're fabulous. Uh, you're looking great. It's very exciting. So can you just reassure us, you know, that you really are in the space station. You're not suspended by hidden wires in a closet someplace. <laughs> Uh, maybe your hair alone kind of gives it away. <laughs> there would be a lot of wires holding my hair up right now if that was what it takes, but I guarantee you uh, uh, we're up in space. Uh, I don't think, in, I'm not a gymnast, so in uh, normal life I don't think I can do this. Wow, very nice, very nice. Here I can do it, I here I can do it as a 10. Slow motion. That was it. <laughs> very nice. So we really appreciate you taking time. Very nice. Very, she stuck the landing. Very, very nice for taking time out of your schedule. You got a lot going on up there. Um, I'd like to introduce you to a few people we have here back on Earth. We have the winners of the uh, YouTube Space Lab competition. We have Dorothy and Sarah and Amr. Greetings, everybody. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Uh, now. Sonny, you've been working I'm on their I'm ex excited to be right? here with you guys. You guys, I was uh, happy to have met you guys uh, in Washington, D.C., and congratulations. I think uh, it's been a little bit of a whirlwind for you since that time, so I, I hope you're enjoying yourself, and uh, we're ex enjoying your experiments up here, so thank you. So uh, you look very relaxed, and uh, you set your microphone down. That's very nice. <laughs> or set your microphone up or <laughs> where is up but uh what is a day like is it i get the impression you guys are busy all the time Well, every day is different, and we are busy all the time. We have a general working day, same as time as you, GMT. Um, but we usually get up around 6 and try to go to sleep around 10. But every day is different. We're doing science experiments. We're exercising. We're out doing spacewalks. We're doing robotic stuff. We just launched H or um, uh, HTV, the Japanese module that was up here, left us yesterday. So it's one thing after another. Every day is a little bit different. It's awesome. Now, uh Spacewalks, launching Japanese modules, uh, making scientific discoveries, that's routine. But you have any other stuff you have to do, like the laundry and dishes and things like that. 
Well, luckily enough, most of our food is um, in containers, and then we throw it away. So um, we don't really have dishes up here. If you think about it, dishes aren't going to work up in space. So we just sort of eat our food out of different types of containers. So we don't have to do that. And um, there's not a lot what of dirt up here, so your clothes don't get dirty for the most part. What sort of food do you get to eat up there? We have a wide variety of food, of which is really great. <laughs> you know, just in this, <laughs> in this little packet, I have beef fajitas, which uh, we usually eat with tortillas because bread is a little crummy, and then it makes a mess and gets in your hair and stuff. Um, a lot of freeze-dried stuff, or dehydrated stuff, I should say. And we have a hydrator right above me. This is um, cauliflower and also spinach in here because my mom's probably watching and wants to know I'm eating my vegetables. And then, of course, there's things in the can. <laughs> and, um, of course, we have can candy and uh, other things like that, which are, you know, everybody likes to eat on Earth. Uh, it does look like, uh, it does look delicious. But how about the experiments? Can you show us the experiments? Oh. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Certainly. I think, I think you're thinking about the experiments that uh, these guys sent up, right? Am's experiments and Dorothy and Sarah's experiments. Yeah. And they're right here with yeah. me. So I have them here in space. Uh, this is a gap. This is Dorothy and Sarah's. And it shows um, a little bit change of color from when you remember it launched. It was before uh, a little bit more red. And then we combined them in the gap experiment. And so now, obviously, with the dye, they've changed, which means uh, there's some definitely some indication of some growth. But we'll have to f see how that goes when they get returned to Earth on SpaceX coming up at the end of October. So this is where there's a dye that changes with the acidity. And so when, as the uh, bacteria metabolize, whoa, as they metabolize, it changes color. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so you guys and have the a other experiment, right now? which I think. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. The other experiment, which I think you guys want to take a look at, if we can get it, the camera to focus is, uh, of course, our little Nefertiti here. Let's see if she can get in focus. Hold on. Can you see her? She's pretty in, she's in focus, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of uh, dead but She's a little flies. scary. <laughs> I think she's been eating well. <laughs> So, uh, uh, um, do you have a question about your spider here? Uh, yeah, I, I'll show you a question. So, I, I see there are a lot of dead flies hanging around in the uh, silk threads. Did you, did you get to see her actually do the jump? Oh, yeah. I, you know, she was in the CGBA, I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, in, in her habitat there, and then also in the locker where the uh, payload folks were able to see her with the camera and that was that's what this is contained right here but every now and then of course I took her and Cleopatra out and fed them you know by opening the plungers and opening so more fruit flies would come out and one day I was doing that I had the light on like this because as you know um, they hunt in the daytime and I wanted to take a look and see if I could see her and my gosh, I saw her stalking a fruit fly, unbeknownst to that poor little fruit fly. And she was looking at it, and she was going real close, and all of a sudden she jumped right on her. So it was amazing. And so I think the spiders absolutely um, adapted to space. It was incredible to watch. Wow. I mean, okay. I'm watching you. You're very <laughs> impressed. I was really, no, that's very cool. So they were able, the spider's able to adapt just as you predicted on. <laughs> So, uh, Sarah, Dorothy, do you have a question for Sonny? Yeah. Hi, Sonny. Hi. So, um, we were wondering, can you see any differences in, like, how yellow each test tube is to show the levels, perhaps, that our bacteria has grown depending on the medium it's in? I'm sorry. Can you repeat your question one more time? 
Are there like different um, levels of yellow? Like, can you see the different color changes, or are they all the oh, same color? No, they're all they're all different. Actually, this one came. I just randomly picked number five. I'm, you know, but they all have a slightly different color. This one is uh, really nice and orange, but some are a lighter color and some are a darker color of red. So yeah, they all have a little bit different. So. Um, you know, I didn't get the, I was wondering about all the data points that you guys picked because I w was wondering why they were all the different colors. And I noticed it pretty much the first time I, I took them out and looked at them when I was taking the pictures that they were definitely different ones, had different colors. So you're going to see some interesting results when, when you get these back. And you know right now we're keeping them at four degrees in this chamber, so um, it should maintain its, uh, w you know, where it is until it gets back on the earth for you. Sounds great. So that's what you guys predicted, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> that's not bad, people. Yeah. Look at you. Both of you, both experiments came out pretty much the way you predicted. And, Sonny, you are an extraordinary part of this, and we <laughs> very much appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so it's not just that these guys here have been hoping to ask you questions, and thank you for answering, but we have some questions from uh, their classmates in Michigan in the United States. Here we go. Hey, Dorothy and Sarah, and everyone in the studio. We're back here in Troy, Michigan, and we also have a question for Sunny the astronaut. Obviously, the Olympics were this summer, but we were wondering how international relations changed after we found out who got the gold medal. <laughs> Very interesting question. Um, we actually, you know, we have a little bit delayed TV up here. If we get streaming video, uh, it's called KU. And so during the Olympics, we would get KU and get all of the highlights of the Olympics at dinner time, which was great as a group. We would gather around the table and watch the Olympics. And I thought it was more of a bonding experience between all of us as we are cheering for each other's teams. Like when Japan would win and when Russia would win, we'd all be like psyched for each other. And I think that that's really good for um, international relations. It was not, uh, you know, on anything bad. It was more like we were supporting each other, and uh, you know, got to know each other's athletes through through the other the knowledge of the other uh, crewmate on board. So it was really fun. That's very good news. Very good news because. Our next question comes from an Olympic gold medalist, the guy who competing with spiders uh, was the long jumper who won, Greg Rutherford. Greg. Hi, Sonny. Greg Rutherford here. Just going to ask you a quick question. If our spider was my size, she could outjump me on Earth, but could she outjump me in space? Well, I think just by mass, uh, I think you could probably outjump the spider. Here. No, good. Well, that's good. It's good to know. Our next question comes from the flight director of the Mars Curiosity rover mission, Babak Ferdowsi, the Mohawk man. Babak. Here at the Jet Propulsion Lab, we work on robotic missions. What we'd like to know is, how can we further improve robotic missions to help human exploration? That's, you know, a really great question because some people sometimes think that robotics and human spaceflight are a little bit, you know, back and forth. There's some type of competition there. But I think robotics are awesome because they'll take the first step where we haven't had the technology developed quite yet for humans to go. And then the second thing they can do, um, once humans get there, they can take on um, repetitive tasks and do repetitive tasks su such that the humans can take then the next step in exploration. So I think robotics and humans can step by step and leapfrog each other so we get further and further and understand more about our universe. So I think robotics and human spaceflight together are an awesome combination. That's fantastic. You know, as the uh, CEO of the Planetary Society, this is something we advocate. I'm delighted you feel that way, Sonny. It's just it's great. Let's change the world. So this is good, but we've got tons of questions from our live stream viewers from all over the world. So we're going to start with uh, Pekka Ulala. What is the most beautiful thing you've seen in space? What is the biggest insight you've had, Sonny? 
Well, I, I tell you what it really is humbling is when you look out the window and you see something like the aurora borealis uh, or the, you know, the, the lights in the southern hemisphere also. It, it's just amazing because it really puts us in our place that we're, um, you know, the energy around us and in the universe is overwhelming and more than we can even imagine with our minds. And there's, there's more and more for us to discover out there. And then, of course, looking at our planet, it's just pretty. I mean, it's blue, it's green, it's purple. The clouds are forming, the ice is forming. It is just spectacular. And I've, I've said it a number of times, I wish everybody would be able to take a lap around the planet and then they'd have a much better appreciation for it and the people who live there. And it's, it's just so peaceful and pretty. Oh, that's great. You are our ambassador. You are our woman in space. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. This one from Cadden or Caden Kuchera. Does it ever bother you to be in such a small area, in such a confined space up there? Oh, gosh, no. You know, this place is, is great. And I was here when it was a little bit small, and we only had three people, and now we have six. But we have, you know, over 10 modules, and, you know, it goes different directions from the front of the spacecraft all the way back to the, you know, the Russian segment back there. It's like a five-story house. There's windows to look out of. Um, you know, everything in space is more fun. Cleaning is fun. So you don't get tired of being inside because there's always a lot of things to do. And uh, every now and then you get to go outside, too. Um, so that's a lot of fun as well. So, no, I never get tired of being inside here. It's, it's great. That's cool. Uh, we have another question from Brianna Page Henderson. About how long is your training? How long did you work to get ready for this? And uh, what are some of the things you had to do to prepare? You know, that's a great question. I think people don't realize that it, um, you know, the space station, like I said, is big and there are a lot of things. You know, we don't have uh, electricians and plumbers and com computer, uh, you know, IT folks up here. Uh, we do it all ourselves. And the, so the training uh, can, is about two and a half years and it consists of learning about the U.S. segment modules, the Japanese, the European, the Russian. So that means a lot of travel around the world. Uh, learning the Russian language also because we fly up in a Russian Soyuz vehicle. Uh, we learn about how that spacecraft works. And so the training is pretty extensive um, on skills base so we can be able to do all that plumbing, elect electrical stuff, water stuff, science stuff. Um, so it's a lot of skills base, but it's about two and a half years and it's, it's a lot of fun. That's when you get to know your crew because we all train together. Now, speaking of getting, getting to know you're through, we, I think none of us uh, could miss. Somebody went flying over <laughs> your right shoulder. Who was that? So that was Aki. Um, you know, of course, he represents the Japanese Space Agency here. Uh, him and myself and Yuri Malenchenko from the Russian Space Agency flew up on a Soyuz. But also, who's up here at, on a different Soyuz, getting ready to go home on Sunday, is Joe Akaba, another American, and then two Russians, Gennady Padalka, Sergei Revin. So we've got a, a sorted a sundry of people, and um, in, in another month or so, another Soyuz will come up with another American and two Russians. So it's pretty busy up here with spacecraft coming and going and people flying in flying out this is a laboratory we're working here so you're gonna see people moving around but they move around in extraordinary ways <laughs> I mean they're all flying it's pretty cool uh, so we, we have another question from our uh, our social media this is from Douglas Martin what does Sirius look like uh, when you're up there uh, when you're closer to the star Sirius is a star or what does any other star look like, really? So it's an interesting question, and in a, a, you know we're only about you know 250 miles, you know 400 kilometers above the Earth. So we're when you're thinking relatively, that's not very far from the surface of the Earth. When you're thinking about how far other planets are and stars are, so size is about the same as you would see from Earth. However, without any atmosphere, uh, the universe is crystal clear. You can really see the 3D of the 
darkness that's going out there. I mean, it doesn't look like a black sheet. It's like it just goes on and on. Likewise, stars are crystal clear and they're bright. And so you see definitely different sizes, just like you do on Earth of stars, that some are smaller and some are bigger. But they are just crystal clear. And at night, it's, you know, it's like millions and millions of stars. You know, it's in some place you've been where there's no light pollution and it's just a crystal clear day. It's beautiful. That's cool. So you guys, do you have any other questions? You got it right here, yeah. right there. I have a question. Uh, how many sunrises do you see in a day, in a 24 hour? In a 24 hour. So in 24 hours, we go around the Earth 16 times, so you'll see 16 sunrises and sunsets. Um, here in the laboratory, and we've got a window below us, but it's taking some really um, nice pictures, and so we have it covered up with a black cover so the pictures will come out real well. Uh, the coop cupola is around the corner, and you can sometimes it's right where the gym is, and so when you're lifting and working out, uh, you can see the sunrise and sunset right above you. Um, but I tell you, when we were on a spacewalk, you can really tell the difference. Um, the heat, just the heating and cooling from the time when the sun is up and when the time that it's dark is unbelievable. Before the sun even shines on you, you can feel the heat start to uh, generate around your body. Um, so it's impressive, uh, the vacuum of space, how much heating and cooling goes on out there and how much sun changes things. That's fantastic. And I remind you, it's not magic. It's science. That's pretty cool, Sonny. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we're about to lose you. Uh, our satellites are going to lose touch with you. But do you have any final words for the winners, for Dorothy, Sarah, and Amr? Thank you so much. Well, of course, congratulations to you guys. Your experiments were awesome up here. I know that there were thousands of other wonderful participants in this uh, contest or this, I think, more of a gathering of scientific minds of our future. So thanks to everybody who participated. Uh, you guys all made the contest awesome. We're just honored to have been part of it. So thank you. Thank you, Sonny. That's just great. Thank you so much. We'll let you get back to work. Uh, oh, wow, that was just wonderful, wasn't yeah. it? She's flying in space, yeah. you guys. Come on. Uh, thanks, Mission Control. Thank you very much. We'll let you get to back to work, back to work as well. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. NASA Administrator Charles Bolden joined other agency officials and dignitaries at the Washington National Cathedral to honor the life and career of astronaut Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon, who died August 25th. The memorial was broadcast live on NASA television and streamed on NASA.gov and the National Cathedral's website. The historic landmark is considered the spiritual home for the nation and brings Americans together at important moments to pray, commemorate, celebrate, and mourn. Neil Armstrong left more than footprints and a flag on the moon. In fact, as President Obama said in a letter, future generations will draw inspiration from his spirit of discovery. The imprint he left on the surface of the moon and the story of human history is matched only by the extraordinary mark he left on the hearts of all Americans. Fate looked down kindly on us when she chose Neil to be the first to venture to another world and to have the opportunity to look back from space at the beauty of our own. It could have been another, but it wasn't. And it wasn't for a reason. No one no one, but no one could have accepted the responsibility of his remarkable accomplishment with more dignity and more grace than Neil Armstrong. The memorial was befitting the man whose prowess as an X-15 test pilot, whose one giant leap for mankind ushered in a new era of exploration, and whose contributions in academia and the private sector also enabled and inspired others to achieve. Neil Armstrong was 82. One feature of the National Cathedral will long remain an iconic reminder of the Apollo 11 mission commanded by Armstrong. His fellow crew members, 
and their service to the nation and the world in the cause of exploration. The window is one of the centerpieces of, of this cathedral. It's one of the most popular things that people want to see. The center of it is the moon rock that was presented to the cathedral in 1974 by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins. Michael Collins is a graduate of one of the cathedral schools, St. Albans School for Boys. A gift, by the way, of a former NASA administrator, Thomas Paine. The window is, is very, very, uh, stark and very beautiful. One of the larger presentations that we have in this place. And it's very, very impressive in its, uh, in its whole look in, in here and people do seek it out. One of the things that impresses me about it is that, that there is a deep connection between the spiritual enterprise and the exploration of space. Both of them are about exploring, exploring the darkness that's around us as a planet, exploring the darkness from which we come at birth and to which we return at death, the journey inward of the spiritual and the theological, the journey outward of the space programs are very closely connected to exploration and it ties in, in my mind, perfectly and beautifully in this place. I'm David O, lead flight director for the Mars Curiosity Rover, and this is your Curiosity Rover Report. Over the past seven days, we've been doing checkouts of the ARM instruments, including the MOLLE Imager, which is a very versatile instrument that can focus on things that are close by and very far away. The Imager has generated some spectacular shots of the underbelly of the rover and its wheels, of a 1909 Lincoln Penny that we mounted on the rover for calibration purposes so we can check that the camera is operating properly, and it's also been used to generate a nice self-portrait of the mass cam on the rover, a portrait that's taken by the ARM looking back the same way you would take a picture of yourself using a cell phone. We've also been testing the APXS instrument, an instrument for doing contact mineralogy science. It generates spectra that allows us to identify the minerals that are present in a rock. When the checkout of the arm is complete, we'll be continuing our drive to the scientific target Glen Elg, but we'll be stopping along the way to take some video of the Martian moons, Phobos and Deimos, passing overhead. We control the rover from Earth, but we have to operate it on Mars time, and a Martian day is 39 minutes longer than an Earth day. So every day, the whole operation team comes in 40 minutes later, every single day, to send commands to the rover. In the month after landing, my whole family joined me on Mars time, and we got to jump a time zone a day for 30 days, going all the way around the clock. As we did that, we got to explore Mars here at JPL, and to explore Los Angeles at night, and it was a great adventure for the whole family. This has been your Curiosity Rover Report. Check back for more updates on what's happening on Mars. Mars Science Laboratory team members at headquarters were at Washington's Florida House for Mars Day in DC, a celebration of the Curiosity Rover's successful landing on the Red Planet. NASA Mars Program Director Doug McQuistian sure briefed members of Congress and other invited guests on what science Curiosity is expected to provide during its two-year mission. Additional presentations detailed how Curiosity and its suite of 10 science instruments will conduct in Gale Crater the most difficult planetary exploration mission ever undertaken. It is indeed a privilege to be here. NASA Deputy Administrator Lori Garver NASA. delivered the keynote address at the Space 2012 Conference in Pasadena, California. The annual American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Gathering is considered the premier event on space technology, policy, programs, management, and education. This is truly something that we work with together as an industry and government and academia and uh, we look forward to strengthening our partnerships as our commercial space industry assumes even more of a role in this new era of human and scientific space exploration. The theme of this year's AIAA conference was creating a sustainable vision for space. Accepting the award is John Callis, the MER project manager. Also at the conference, the mission team at JPL for NASA's long-lived Mars Exploration Rover's Spirit and Opportunity was presented the Haley Spaceflight Award for the advancement of the art, science, or technology of astronauts. In its eighth year of operation on Mars, Opportunity is surveying a crater rim about 5,200 miles from Curiosity's current position. 
Spirit explored the red planet for more than six years, 24 times longer than its planned three-month mission. Past recipients of the Haley Space Flight Award include astronauts Alan Shepard, John Glenn, Tom Stafford, Bob Crippen, Kathy Sullivan, and the crew of STS-125, the last space shuttle servicing mission to the Hubble Space Telescope. After weathering Hurricane Isaac, engineers at the Stennis Space Center returned to testing the J2X engine. The first post-storm J2X test firing was of the engine's upper stage that lasted 250 seconds. The J2X will help power NASA's Space Launch System, the new heavy lift rocket that'll send astronauts beyond Earth orbit. NASA Chief Technologist Mason Peck joined state and local officials at the University of Texas at El Paso for the official opening of UTEP's Center for Space Exploration Technology Research, or CSTER, and the NASA Science, Engineering, Mathematics, and Aerospace Education Laboratory, located in the university's engineering building. It's the kind of collaborative activity that we uh, now at NASA uh, recognize as essential to how we are trying to uh, Form the future of space technology the agency. The NASA-funded CSTER conducts analytical, experimental, and computational research in energy and propulsion engineering. The Aerospace Education Laboratory offers technology and innovation learning opportunities to students of all ages, from K-12 through to postgraduate and lifelong learners. The vertical water drop test continued for the Orion Multipurpose Crew Vehicle at the Langley Research Center's Hydro Impact Basin. The latest drop for Orion was from a height of 25 feet. Unlike last summer's swing drop tests that certified Orion for water landings, these vertical drop tests help predict Orion's landing loads. Orion is scheduled to launch in 2014 on its Exploration Flight Test 1 and travel 15 times deeper into space than the International Space Station before returning to Earth. The shuttle carrier aircraft that is Space Shuttle Endeavor's ride for the cross-country journey to California made its arrival at the Kennedy Space Center. Like Discovery and Enterprise before it, Space Shuttle Endeavour is taking its turn in the ferry flight spotlight. The first-class piggyback ride atop the SCA culminates for NASA's youngest orbiter at Los Angeles International Airport, with appearances along the way in the skies over several NASA installations, including the Johnson Space Center, Stennis, Michu, White Sands, and the Ames Research Center. Endeavour is scheduled to arrive at its new home, the California Science Center, on October 13th and go on display October 30th. Meanwhile, the structure for the new Florida home of Space Shuttle Atlantis has been topped out with its highest beam. In a ceremony marking a milestone in the construction of the 90,000 square foot exhibit hall that will house the orbiter at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, the 38-foot-long, one-ton steel beam was lifted 116 feet off the ground and locked into place. A small tree and an American flag were fitted onto the beam that bore the signatures of hundreds of NASA employees. Atlantis, the last space shuttle to ever fly in space, is going to look like it actually is in space here at the Kennedy Space Center. And I can't think of a more fitting place uh, to tell that story. On November 2nd, Atlantis will be the last shuttle to move out of the operational area at KSC. The shuttle will be transported by the Orbiter Transport Vehicle, or OTV, from the Vehicle Assembly Building to the Visitor Complex. For the very last time, two space shuttles were parked today in the same place. And the last of the shuttle workers were there to saying farewell to Endeavour. West 2's Dan Billow reports it was all about getting Endeavour ready to fly away. Endeavour, complete with a new set of spinners, rolled out of its hangar for the last time. We can ask for no better job than what we had. The good ship Endeavour, still wearing the scars of 25 space flights, is buttoned up for a flight to L.A., a flight it can no longer make on its own power. Well, happy to have accomplished our goal, but also sad to really think that, that this is the last time Endeavour will be in her home. 
Now that all work is finished on Endeavour, sister ship Atlantis is moving into the only remaining shuttle hangar to be finished up by the remaining shuttle workers, most of whom, about 7,000, were laid off. As the shuttles switched places, NASA parked them nose to nose, the last time two space shuttles will occupy the same ground. It's another farewell to an era, a way of life, a job. They're cherishing the work they're getting to do and cherishing the time they get out here and keeping their fingers crossed that they'll get a job with another contractor. Atlantis will go on display at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, Endeavor at a Los Angeles museum, which will require a historic trip on wheels through the streets of Tinseltown. They'll have entertainment planned along the route. They have uh, a lot of uh, uh, stars who have been clamoring to participate. Endeavor's flight is in mid-September. Until then, she'll be in the Vehicle Assembly Building. At the Kennedy Space Center, Dan Billow, WASH 2 News. A little over two hours ago, as uh, the uh, crew members uh, began their final preparations, uh, for uh, the Soyuz vehicle and its upcoming undocking. They had a, a moment to gather at the hatchway uh, to the Soyuz spacecraft in the Poisk module, again, the module to which the uh, Soyuz TMA-04M docked back on May 17th. The Poisk module is the space-facing module and docking port uh, on the Zvezda service module. Uh, Sonny Williams and uh, Malenchenko and Hoshide, their Soyuz vehicle, the O5M spacecraft is docked to the Rosviet module on the Earth-facing side of the Russian segment of the International Space Station. Uh, but uh, about two hours ago, the crew members had an opportunity uh, to say farewell to one another. So let's, uh, let's roll that tape uh, of the activities that occurred at about 12.30 p.m. Central Time today. You see uh, Williams, Hoshide, and Malenchenko uh, saying uh, farewell there to uh, Sergei Revin and Akaba and Gennady Padalka will uh, float into the field of view. Those particles you see uh, were identified by the environmental systems officer as uh, dust particles. That's not uncommon. It's just that the light uh, in the module at this time uh, illuminated those dust particles. You see uh, the offgoing Commander Padalka hugging the new commander of the space station, Sonny Williams, who uh, will, uh, along with her crewmates, uh, have control of the International Space Station until they come home on November 12th. Padalka waving goodbye. The crew actually entered the Soyuz vehicle uh, to begin a series of uh, switch configurations uh, in advance of the actual closing of the hatches uh, to the spacecraft. Do you see the this view now uh, from a camera on the Soyuz vehicle. You can see the crosshair docking target on the right side uh, of the screen. This also providing uh, informational data for the Russian flight controllers as they will watch uh, the Soyuz back away from the Poisk module. About one minute away from physical separation of the two vehicles. System. And we confirm that the screen a one is off. The International Space Station flying just south of Nairobi, Kenya. Copy. Skirting up uh, the east coast of Africa. Yes, we see it on the trainer, so now we're going to restart so we can see the SSVP. Copy. Padalka, Revan, and Akaba launched on a warm, sunny morning from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan back on May 15th, arrived at the International Space Station two days later, now about to depart for the final time. Physical separation confirmed. Yes, uh, the SSVP mode has been restarted, so you should see it on the camera. Undocking occurring on time at 6.09 p.m. Central Time over Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, 
убрали яркость. So we remove the contrast. Now we can see the the brightness. Now we can see the target very well. Do you see any foreign objects on the interface of the docking mechanism? We do not see it through the display. We see the target very well and the structural element. Copy. So are we sending, uh, are we selecting the narrow lens? Uh, we can see the target very well. Gennady, you need to select a narrow lens. Slowly backing away from the Poisk module at a rate of about one tenth of a meter per second. Activate the brightness before we send the command for the special lens. Two minutes from now, there'll be a separation burn of 15 second firing of the Soyuz engines to increase the opening rate. So we have selected the narrow angle lens. Now we can see the picture on the ground. Zero two ten thirty. We can see all the structural elements very well and the target copy. We have selected DPOB copy. Expedition thirty three now has officially begun under the command of Sonny Williams, joined by Yuri Malenchenko and Aki Hoshide aboard the International Space Station. They'll be tending uh, to the station as a three-person crew for the better part of a month. Elements are visible, but we do not see the target any longer, so it's difficult for us to judge where it is. Copy. I can see the antenna. Copy. Standing by for the uh, separation burn. This will be a uh, now we can half a meter per second uh, change in velocity. Again, a 15 second burn of the Soyuz engines that will enable the Soyuz to drift away from the International Space Station to an eventual distance of 12 kilometers for the deorbit burn that is scheduled at 8.56 p.m. Central Time. And the separation burn is underway, confirmed by the visiting vehicle officer. Copy. Padalka, Revan, and Akaba bidding farewell to the complex that has been their home for 123 days. Copy. So now we are maneuvering to the larger diameter, so we'll have a better view. Copy. Oh, please continue your comments on the range. Yes, we can still see uh, the station. We are getting a stable uh, photo or rather video copy. Uh, we see the large diameter very well. 50 meters we can. And once again, uh, the final uh, Moments uh, of the descent of the Soyuz uh, spacecraft under its chute. You can see one of the Russian uh, search and recovery helicopters uh, that will land uh, within seconds after touchdown. And standing by for touchdown. And touchdown confirmed, the soft landing engines firing. The touchdown has occurred at 9.53 p.m. Central Time, 10.53 p.m. Eastern Time, just north of Arkalik, Kazakhstan. Gennady Padalka, Sergey Revin, and Joe Akaba back on Earth.
You can see the glare of the uh, early morning sunlight on Monday morning at the landing site in Kazakhstan, uh, where the temperature is in the uh, low to mid 60s. A cloudless sky. Uh, a Gagarin cosmonaut training center photographer peering inside uh, the open hatch uh, to the Soyuz vehicle. And there's our first view of Gennady Padalka, the uh, Soyuz commander, veteran cosmonaut, as he sits in the bright sunshine of a Monday morning, having completed his fourth flight into space in 711 days, making him the fourth most experienced space traveler in history. Second crew member now out, and that would be uh, Sergey Revin, we believe. The uh, crew members uh, who are situated in the left and right seats of the uh, descent module take uh, a few more minutes uh, to extract than the commander, who is a straight shot out of the center seat through the hatch. And uh, we are awaiting uh, the extraction of Joe Acaba. And uh, here comes Joe Acaba as a flight engineer out of the Soyuz spacecraft, completing his second flight into space 13 days aboard the space shuttle Discovery in March of 2009 on the STS-119 mission, now home after four months aboard the International Space Station. And there's a unique uh, shot we're watching Gennady Padalka signing his name uh, to the uh, Soyuz TMA 04M. Josh, the next time you do this in November, the landing for Sonny Williams, Aki Hoshide, and Yuri Malenchenko will be just after sunrise in November. I don't think it's going to be quite as warm. As uh, the crew is uh, making their way inside the medical tent, uh, information is always uh, wonderful to come by and uh, from a variety of sources. Uh, we find out that uh, the signing of their names on the spacecraft unique to this particular landing because uh, this uh, spacecraft is going to be moved uh, to the uh, Shalkovsky Museum in Kaluga, uh, Russia. Uh, the Shalkovsky Museum named after the father of uh, Russian spaceflight, Konstantin Shalkovsky. So a very unique and historic uh, moment uh, for this crew to have the privilege of signing their names to their spacecraft that brought them home. Good morning, this is Mission Control Houston. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's edition of ISS Update this Monday, September 17. You're now getting a live view inside the International Space Station Flight Control Room where the team here has been uh, monitoring the systems aboard the station and uh, supporting the day's activities of the now Expedition 33 crew members. Leading the Orbit 2 team here in the Station Flight Control Room today is Flight Director Ed Van Seis. And next to him serving as Capcom is Lucia McCullough, relaying our ground messages up to the crew. Three crew members of Expedition 32 undocked from the International Space Station and returned safely to Earth last night, wrapping up the mission of a little more than four months aboard the orbiting complex. Flight Engineer Joe Acaba, Commander Gennady Padaka, and Flight Engineer Sergey Revin undocked their Soyuz TMA-04M spacecraft 
from the uh, space station and landed north of Arkalik in Kazakhstan about four hours later at 9.53 p.m. Central Time. It was 8.53 a.m. in uh, Kazakhstan. The trio had arrived at the station back in May. They spent 125 days in space, 123 of which were aboard the orbiting laboratory. Akaba is now on his way back to Houston, and Padak and Revan have returned to Star City. Meanwhile, now in command of the space station, NASA astronaut Sunny Williams and her crewmates, flight engineers Yuri Malenchenko and Aki Hoshide, kicked off their uh, first day of Expedition 33 and will work aboard the station as a three-member crew until the arrival of three new crew members in mid to late October. Malenchenko, Williams, and Hoshide arrived at the International Space Station after docking their Soyuz spacecraft to the uh, Rossviet module on July 16. Today, they complete 64 days in space. The space station with its crew aboard is flying at an altitude of about 255 statute miles. The orbiting facility is now on an east-southeastern track, just coming across southern parts of Canada, just north of the United States. The Expedition 33 crew had adjusted their sleep period to support the Soyuz undocking. They kicked off today with a little later than normal wake-up time at 6.30 a.m. Central Time after a shortened sleep period. The crew today will have a light-duty day and will go to sleep at their nominal sleep time. Today, Commander Sunny Williams is performing maintenance on the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device one of three exercise equipment devices on board the International Space Station that simulates weightlifting here on Earth. She also would deploy two environmental health system formaldehyde monitoring kits and relocate Soyuz emergency equipment. Hoshide opened the uh, lab window shutter for the International Space Station agricultural camera payload and is uh, working to remove and replace the waste and hygiene compartment the urine receptacle and insert filter. Each of the uh, three crew members will put in their daily two hours of exercise using the onboard gym equipment that includes the uh, station bicycle and treadmill and again that advanced resistive exercise device. The crew is then scheduled to go to bed at 4.30 p.m. Central Time. Meanwhile, back on Earth, space station flight controllers are uh, Tracking a piece of debris, flight control team is evaluating to determine if a uh, debris avoidance maneuver will be required. If a maneuver is needed, the uh, preliminary time for the burn would be shortly after 6 a.m. Central Time tomorrow morning. This is Mission Control Houston. The crew now aboard the space station is uh, Commander Sunny Williams, along with her crewmates Aki Hoshide and uh, Yuri Malenchenko. Williams recently took command of the station before uh, undocking activities last night. Yesterday, Sunny uh, Williams had a uh, took time off to uh, participate in the Malibu Triathlon exercise using uh, various uh, exercise equipment on the station uh, to uh, simulate the swimming. She had shown here she's actually using the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device. This is the uh, system that simulates weightlifting here on Earth. And here this simulates the muscles that she would be using as in the swimming portion of the uh, triathlon.
This is Mission Control Houston again. We are watching a uh, video that was downlinked from uh, yesterday's yesterday morning's activities with the uh, the now commander of the space station, Sunny Williams, who is uh, participating in the Malibu Triathlon. Here she is using the advanced resistive exercise device. And in that view, she had just removed the uh, bar that she was using to perform the um, exercise that helps to simulate the swimming portion of the uh, triathlon. And Houston Station on two. We're down with the simulated swim in the transition to get ready for the bike over in the lab. Houston, copy. Again, this is a replay of that downlink video from yesterday. That was an exchange between uh, Commander Sunny Williams on her, uh, with uh, Capcom, who was serving as Capcom yesterday, was uh, Josh Matthew. Now transitioning to the uh, cycle portion of the triathlon. This is Mission Control Houston. We're getting a video replay from a uh, video that was downlinked after yesterday morning's activity just before the uh, Soyuz undocking and successful landing last night. This is the now uh, commander of the space station, Sunny Williams, who is participating in the Malibu Triathlon. She's uh, using all three pieces of equipment there, or exercise equipment there aboard the International Space Station. She started this uh, triathlon with the swim portion, using the advanced resistive exercise device that uh, simulates weightlifting here on Earth. I used that uh, machine to also simulate the swim portion of her triathlon, and then now transition to the onboard stationary bicycle. Again, uh, Williams had participated in the Malibu triathlon yesterday morning before uh, the undocking of her three crewmates, previously commander, previous commander of the station, Gennady Padaka, Sergei Revan, and Joe Acaba, who had uh, spent 125 days there in space, 123 days 
they're aboard the International Space Station. Williams now in command of the space station, along with her uh, crewmates, flight engineers, Aki Hushide and uh, Yuri Malenchenko, currently in the uh, middle of their midday meal for the day aboard the International Space Station. We are looking at replay that was sent down from yesterday morning's activity. Here now we see uh, Williams on the treadmill doing the uh, running portion of the triathlon. Again, Williams participating in the Malibu triathlon began with the uh, swim or a simulated swim using the advanced resistive exercise device then transition to the stationary bicycle and we now see her using the uh, onboard treadmill for the uh, running portion of that triathlon. While exercise is important for all human beings here on Earth, it is essential for uh, crew members living aboard the International Space Station, especially during a long duration stays. Williams is an active participant in exercise and fitness. And while uh, she has regular two hour exercise, she had uh, been training to participate in the triathlon before her flight and uh, Sunday morning, yesterday morning, before her crew members departed from the International Space Station, she was able to participate in that Malibu Triathlon. Again, she used the uh, advanced resistive exercise device to simulate the swim portion, then moved on to the uh, cycle and is now using the treadmill. These are the three pieces of exercise equipment that are aboard, on board the International Space Station that uh, help to keep astronauts fit and uh, eliminate the negative effects on their bodies while staying on station there in the uh, microgravity environment of space. This is Mission Control Houston. Again, we are getting a uh, replay of a video that was uh, downlinked yesterday. This is follow this is uh, her, uh, Sunny Williams, who is now the commander of the space station, participating in the Malibu Triathlon on her uh, third leg of the triathlon. She uh, and Houston on space to ground too. I just wanted to let you know if finish with this activity, this athletic activity of the day. It's probably just about 9 o'clock in Malibu. Um, my watch says 148.43 uh, for the three events and the transitions. And uh, space transitions are a little bit different than the Earth transitions, but they have their, their troubles as well. Hey, uh, and also a big shout out to uh, our astronaut strength and conditioning folks, uh, Mark. David, Bruce, and Jamie, who are really interested in this, particularly Bruce, who uh, got this whole workout put together, and the guys in the exercise lab, Alan Moore, 
I was able to uh, translate the Malibu biking into a SEVIS protocol here. So a big thanks to all those guys. Uh, another shout out to Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who is really interested in health and fitness and uh, came to Johnson Space Center to talk about astronaut health and fitness and what it's going to take to get humans back on and on to Mars. So thanks for everybody for your support and, uh, and ideas about health and fitness and how important it is uh, for humans and, uh, and getting us back into long duration space flight. So big thanks. I'm happy to be done. It wasn't easy, and I'm sure everybody out in California is really excited to be done, too. Take care, and thank you. Well, Bonnie, thanks very much, and congratulations on completion of the first triathlon in space. And uh, absolutely, uh, it's uh, critically important to understand uh, human uh, physiology and, and how to keep you all uh, strong on orbit so that when you come home, you're strong when you get back. And we'll see proof of that later tonight when uh, Joe and uh, his crewmates, their uh, return in the Soyuz. So we're looking forward to that. And thanks again. We'll pass on your, your kudos to uh, everybody who helped put that together. Well done. And standing by for touchdown. And touchdown confirmed. Expedition 32 officially ended on the International Space Station when the Soyuz spacecraft carrying NASA flight engineer Joe Acaba and Commander Gennady Panalka and flight engineer Sergey Revin of the Russian Federal Space Agency undocked from the station's Poisk module. The trio landed safely in Kazakhstan at 10.53 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time Sunday, September 16th. Akaba, Padalka, and Revan spent 123 days on board the orbiting laboratory. NASA astronaut Sonny Williams has taken over control of the station as commander of Expedition 33. She and her crewmates, flight engineer Aki Hoshide of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, and Russian cosmonaut Yuri Malenchenko are scheduled to stay on board until November 12th. Three future residents of the International Space Station previewed their upcoming mission during a media briefing at the Johnson Space Center. Expedition 34 and 35 crew members Tom Marshburn of NASA, Chris Hadfield of the Canadian Space Agency, and Roman Romanenko of the Russian Federal Space Agency are set to launch to the station December 5th. We're always looking at ways to getting even better medical judgment up there. And in a small way, I'm, uh, my medical judgment is what's going to add to the uh, to the medical care on board. So I, I want to be a part of, of getting that on board a spacecraft even more. Some really critical operations done in the last couple of weeks, overcoming some big significant hurdles and having the space station uh, with the combination of the electrical repair and the EVAs, demonstrating the, the necessity for continued expertise and, uh, and skill in, in this thing that is space flight. When they arrive at the world's only research laboratory in microgravity, the trio will join NASA astronaut Kevin Ford and Russian cosmonauts Evgeny Terelkin and Oleg Novitsky, who are scheduled to launch to the ISS from Russia on October 15th. Given your unique qualifications to ask you to serve as the first science officer on the International Space Station. But of course I'd be extremely honored to be the first science officer. Ten years ago, on September 16th, 2002, Expedition 5 crew member Peggy Whitson was named as the first NASA science officer of the International Space Station. Since then, each expedition crew has had a NASA science officer working with the U.S. research community to maximize returns of station science experiments. During her tenure as science officer, Whitson conducted 21 investigations in human life sciences and microgravity sciences, as well as commercial payloads. Bilderbuchlandung nach vier Monaten im All. Im Morgengrauen ist die knapp drei Tonnen schwere Soyuz-Kapsel von der Internationalen Raumstation ISS zurückgekehrt. Sie landete in der Steppe von Kasachstan. Die Besatzung, bestehend aus zwei russischen Kosmonauten und einem US-Astronauten, ist wohl auf. Den Männern ging es sogar so gut, dass sie kurz nach ihrer Landung die Raumkapsel signiert. In Kasachstan. Nach vier Monaten im All ist am Morgen eine Soyuz-Kapsel mit drei Raumfahrern an Bord auf die Erde zurückgekehrt. Die zwei Russen und ein Amerikaner hatten auf der internationalen Raumstation ISS Experimente durchgeführt. 
Die dreiköpfige ISS-Mannschaft soll Mitte Oktober wieder Verstärkung bekommen. Landung in Kasachstan. Nach vier Monaten im All ist am Morgen eine Soyuz-Kapsel mit drei Raumfahrern der Internationalen Raumstation an Bord auf die Erde zurückgekehrt. Die zwei Russen und ein Amerikaner hatten auf der ISS zahlreiche Experimente durchgeführt. Die jetzt noch dreiköpfige ISS-Mannschaft soll Mitte Oktober wieder Verstärkung bekommen. Gennady, congratulations on the successful mission. We are very, very glad to see you here. And all the best to you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Bravo. Good to see you. Hello, Yuri. Happy birthday, Daddy. Beautiful flowers. Thank you. 